This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. In the name of the one who is returning a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ. There's a lady in Palmyra, Missouri, who has quite a green thumb. Her name is Mary Luton. Mary Luton lives in Palmyra, Missouri, and was attending the Hannibal Senior Expo last April. And someone gave her a packet of, of seeds, pumpkin seeds. And there are only four pumpkin seeds in the packet. And she's been an avid gardener her whole life. And she said, I'm, I'm just going to plant one of them in my little patch that I have by my apartment. Mary's 91 years old. And she planted it on the uh, north side of her apartment complex. The newspaper reported on what happened with that pumpkin seed. She said, I kept the biggest seed and I gave the other three away, and it was the lucky one. It kept growing and growing and getting bigger. And by mid-August, there was a pumpkin on it that had turned into a gargantuan specimen measuring 73 inches around. It was the talk of the neighborhood. Friends, relatives, and neighbors from the housing complex would come by and just stand and gaze at this enormous pumpkin. And the question everybody asked was, how much does it weigh? And eventually the pumpkin was harvested from its vine and some men had to pick it up and they put it gently onto a scale and it weighed a hefty 103 pounds. Mary says, I love to garden. She says, I've gardened my whole life and every little spot I can find, I plant something. And she has planted things at her apartment now, including tomatoes, zucchinis, peppers, onions, green beans, herbs, and edibles for cooking. I think we would say Mary Luton has a green thumb. And perhaps you know the type. You want your plant to thrive. You want vegetables to be produced. You want flowers to blossom. Give it to that person. They have the knack to make life out of plants. That might be just a little bit of a glimpse with what we're talking about today in John chapter 5. In John chapter 5, we're going to talk about someone who brings life, but not a green thumb, not just with plants, but with people. He has a green thumb. We're going to talk about the Son of Man, the one that was described in every one of our readings today, the one who brings ultimate life. As we do that today and look closer at John 5, this will be magnified because we are talking in the end times. The world around us is waning. Love has grown cold. The signs of the end are near. Earthquakes, famines, fires, birth pangs in various places, the Lord Jesus called them. The end is coming. And not only is the end and the signs coming, but also what's all around us every single day, week, and month? Death. Death is around us. And it's probably no coincidence that we celebrate the four weeks of the end times in the church here in the fall. As the world wanes and nature begins to wane and the leaves begin to fall, we think of the end of time as well. So in that context, let's look at the life bringer today. The one in John 5 who says that he is the one who has the authority to bring it, first of all. And then also here he'll say he has the power to bring it. Now, before we dig back into these verses, though, you have to know the context of, of John 5 to fully get this and appreciate it. At the beginning of John 5, Jesus healed a man who was lame and crippled. He calls him an invalid. And he was lying at a pool um, in Jerusalem called Bethesda. And at this pool called Bethesda, Jesus came one day and he saw this man. He had been an invalid for 38 years, it says. And Jesus told him, get up and walk, pick up your mat, get out of here. So the man picks up his mat, he's walking around, it's miraculous, it's a miracle. He is cured and healed. Now later that day, the Jewish leaders saw him and it was the Sabbath day. And so they say, why are you carrying your mat? You're not supposed to carry your mat, it, that's work. And he said, the one who healed me told me to carry my mat, so I'm carrying my mat. So they try to find who did this, and it was Jesus. 
And so they begin to call him out for telling this man to carry his mat. And Jesus tells them that he's doing the work of his father. And so it says they persecuted him. He, he did this miracle. He, he brought healing, life, cure to this man. And he is being persecuted for this. And so Jesus answers them in John 17 after that. My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only because he was breaking the Sabbath, but because he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Then come the words of our text. To fully appreciate this, Jesus is taking the conversation from a healing where he gave this man his life back to a bigger topic of life and how he is the one who brings it. And to do that, he begins with common ground. Who did they acknowledge had the power to make life? God the Father. They would always acknowledge him. God the Father does. And so he goes to common ground, we would say, and acknowledges that too, but then talks about how he has the authority to give life and healing even on the Sabbath day. He said in verse 26 here, As the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. So the Father just exists. He's self-sustaining, doesn't depend on anybody. And he has granted that to the Son as well. The Son is self-sustaining. He just has life in himself because God the Father chose to give that to him too. In one of our creeds, we say that the Son was begotten of the Father from eternity. Before time began, before this world was, at some time, we wouldn't even say time, time hadn't been invented yet, God the Father begat, Father the Son gave him life in himself. Wow! But they are both above time. But the Father chose to do that for some reason. They are both self-sustaining. And then the Son also says in verse 19, he said, very truly, the Son can do nothing by himself, but he only does what the Father is doing. The Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. As the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. And the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. He goes on farther with how he has authority to do these things. He can give life. Not only is he self-sustaining, he can give it as a gift too. And at the end, he will judge to life because he has that authority as well. The Son has authority over life. He imitates the Father. Have you ever heard the phrase, like Father, like Son? Maybe you know a case of that like in your neighborhood someone down the street, or maybe one of your extended relatives. It really is a case of like father, like son. Maybe it's characteristics, appearance, personality, the way they walk, maybe the profession the son wants to do, something about it, but you go, boy, it's like father, like son. Here we have the ultimate case, like father, like son. And the father has imparted these things to his son because he loves him. Think about that. This is not a business relationship. This is not an impersonal relationship. This is a loving relationship within the Trinity as the Father has entrusted this authority to the Son. Let's pause there one second. That's our first lesson today. Jesus has all authority over life. But we have to say, first of all, today, this is going to blow our mind. Isn't it? That This is a great mystery to us. We cannot comprehend these things with our puny mind, that there was a God, the Father from eternity, who begat or fathered a son, and they are now equals. They now have life within themselves, and they love each other, and they work together, and who can comprehend such things? And yet we accept them by faith. And the second thing about this authority is we would never view Jesus as inferior to the Father. They don't look at it that way. They have equal status in glory with each other. In verse 23, Jesus had said, Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. All may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. 
Even that verse I read before our reading here today said that they were trying to kill him because he was calling God his father, making himself equal with God. That was the point. The son is surely living a life of humility right now, but he is not inferior to his heavenly father because that's how God the father set it up. The point is though, the son has been given this authority to exist and impart life because God the father chose. So there's the philosophical part today. Now how about the practical part? How does he make life? How does he bring life? What power does he show in doing this? Oh, Jesus said plenty about that. He said in verse 24, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. A time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, he has granted the Son to have life in himself. What does that mean? And when do those things happen? When you, when you first read those verses, you think this, this is judgment day. This is down the road. This is something to come. But it's not. It's not. Because Jesus here says, whoever hears his voice has crossed over from death to life. That life has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. This is happening now, Jesus says. So what does this mean? He is talking about conversion to faith. He is talking about coming to faith, coming to believe in your Savior, and that's happening now. This makes much sense when we think of, of Genesis 3 and the first sin. God told Adam and Eve, in the day that you eat of that forbidden fruit, you will surely die. Did they die that day? I always wondered that when I was back in Sunday school. Did, they didn't die that day, did they? Yes, they did. But we think of physical death at first. They died spiritually that day. There was a, a wall between them and God that day. They were spiritually dead in need of a Savior that very day. Ephesians 2 also sheds light on this when it says in the New Testament, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Spiritually, we're called dead. We are not called injured, a little bit sin sick, a little weak, a little hurt. A victim of bad circumstances, we're called dead in sin. And then that reference in Ephesians 2 goes on and says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. It is by grace you have been saved. Jesus shows his power to bring life now. He does it by turning sinners to faith and giving them life now. This is important for us to know today. Because I think when a lot of people think Jesus is going to bring life, they think, well, that's coming in a long time. That's coming down the road. That's not here yet. It has come to you now, and you're supposed to live in it now. When you go home today, you can have peace of mind. You can have peace of conscience. Your Savior died for your sins. He rose again. He's imparted these blessings to you now. Your sins are forgiven. You are a saint. You know God is going to provide for your needs. You know God is going to get you through your troubles and struggles. You have eternal life beginning now. What a blessing that is. And that puts perspective on every day. It puts perspective on every week. Jesus is the life bringer and has the power to bring it now. And then he talked about later. He also said in verse 28, <clears throat> Do not be amazed at this as if this weren't enough. For a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. So then, as the, the, the uh, end, uh, the, the big finish, Jesus says, one day I'm going to return and the dead will all rise. 
You will see that and be amazed at that. The resurrection of all people. Do you like hors d'oeuvres? You know that an hors d'oeuvre is a little snack you have before the main meal? An hors d'oeuvre is just a little taste, a little bite of something, and they, they come in all shapes and sizes, crackers and meatballs with toothpicks and all kinds of things, and they're, they're pretty good. Jesus has given us hors d'oeuvres of the last day already. Maybe you can think of some. How about the man at the pool? That's just a little hors d'oeuvre of what Jesus can do. All those parables that Jesus talked about the end of the world, all those miracles he did where he healed people, cured them. There were even three miracles Jesus did where he raised someone from the dead. And remember what happened when he died? When the temple curtain was torn in two? And when sin was paid for? It says in Matthew 27, at that time the earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. There's just a few hors d'oeuvres there of what happens when Jesus comes to town. He brings life all over the place. This is the true Son of God, the life bringer, who will bring it at the end of time as well. All will rise, but not all are going to be judged well. Not all are going to be judged to life. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. Hold it now. Did Jesus really say that? Those who have done what is good. Does that mean we're going to have to throw out all this saved by grace? Saved by the grace of God through faith? We'll have to get a different banner up here. Is Jesus changed? Are we really saved by our good works, by what we do? Do we earn our forgiveness? Not at all. What does Jesus mean here? This has to be taken in the context of what he said in John 15 about the role of good works. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever remains in me will bear much fruit. It's a picture of good works. If you are saved by grace, you're going to do good works. If you are saved through faith, you are going to do many good things that are considered fruit in God's garden. If you are saved by the grace of God, you're going to live for him out of love and thanks. The role of good works is they're a result of being saved by the grace of God. They don't earn forgiveness. They don't merit it. But they're always a result of being saved. That section in Ephesians 2 that we read before it finishes, For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. It's the result. That's why on, in Matthew 25, where the, Jesus has the sheep and the goats in mass judgment, what does he point to when he talks to his people? Come and receive your inheritance. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was in prison, and you visited me, and all those things. He points to their work as evidence that they are his people and his saints. After all, if you're going to go to court, you have to have evidence. So what power Jesus has for you in your life? This is important for you because are there days where you wonder what's going to happen to you at the end? Are there days where you have some fears and some doubts, some ignorance or some worry? about whether you're going to be on that right hand of God, about whether you're going to be raised from the dead, about whether you're going to see Jesus face to face or not. Now, human nature, that, that might cause us fears and, and doubts some days. But here, Jesus, he leaves no doubt. He converts to life. He will resurrect to life. And he will judge to life because he has the power over life. So finally, some people may have green thumbs, Give them your plant. Give them your vegetable. Have them start your tomato plant. But Jesus, far and away, is the greatest life bringer. The one who brings people to life and also brings them produ to produce fruit and good works as his people who are saved by grace. So in the end times, as we see the world of nature waning, as we see the signs in the earth as well with, with people, that the end is near, as we see death 
around us. Rejoice in the life bringer. He has authority over life. And he shows his power over life. May these things comfort us as we live in the end times. Amen. Please rise.